Hey guys, welcome to Dallas. Uh, Jake, I know we talked before for uh, Percy Jackson. Oh yeah, so, uh, yeah, good, good to see you. Guys back here. Thanks. Uh, talk a little bit about working with Andrew Nichol. He's always been one of my favorite directors, mm -hmm. and he brings a real interesting style and look to his films. And, and mm -hmm. you know, on this one especially, it's got a very unique sort of feel to it. It almost feels like you're kind of reading like a an interesting graphic novel in a way. And so yeah, talk a little bit about I've never heard that. I haven't heard anyone say that before. That's really interesting. Um, I mean, Gattaca being his sort of his premier science fiction film, I, for me personally, and it may piss a lot of people off, but I think it's his closest return to Gattaca, yeah. uh, sort of in style and form and, 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 and story-wise. Um, he's one of the most meticulous directors I've ever worked for, mm. Peter Jackson being the second. Um, I mean, Andrew would come in and, and move a piece of gauze because it was not in the right place in the background. Quite literally. Literally, yeah, that happened. Um, but he, he, his, his office in pre-production was papered. 360 degrees, the entire movie was stuck to the wall. Um, all the locations, all our characters, every scene. So you could walk into his office, start here, walk around, and you watch the movie. Uh, and, just and I think what's important to, to know is that every single detail you see, uh, cars, weapons, costumes, Extras. He, extras. He cast every single extra. He is responsible for all of it, which is so often not the case. You know, people are signed to do that kind of thing. But he did it. You know, he got four hours sleep. Um, so every... He gave himself hives because he worked so hard. He literally had hives on his face. I think that's a testament to his, no, to his nature. So with that kind of meticulousness, was there room for improv? Did you guys get a chance to kind of bring your own you know, things to your, each, each of your individual characters? Absolutely. We had two weeks of rehearsal that we were all a part of, which never happens. I believe that was the request of William Hurt. Um, and that made all the difference in the world. The movie would not be what it is without that two weeks of rehearsal. And I feel like it might be a bit harder for us to stand by it had we not had that, because mm -hmm. we found everything that was hidden that wasn't on the surface. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you don't get that. You really, really don't. All right, so fun conceptual question here. Okay. You guys get to be the spirits. Who is your host, if you could pick anybody? Well, um, <laughs> usually I say JV, but I've just had a conversation next door where I decided to be uh, the North Korean dictator, <laughs> Kim, Kim Jong Un. Jong -un. <laughs> because. I think it, the, how long do you get in the body? If it's a lifetime, I think I'd go for Jay Z. If it was Kim Jong Un, you could make some serious changes if you had 24 hours. So, uh, the one. <laughs> <laughs> Another adaptation said it was it could they could be alive or dead. So then, yeah, we we started getting a little bit more sophisticated in our answers, and I said Nikola Tesla or Albert Einstein for the same kind of reason. Yeah. What could you do? Uh, I don't know if I would really change anything if I were this person, but uh, John Lennon. Imagine that. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I was actually going to get a Mustang GT. Jared was going to drive a Mustang GT. And then they decided to put me in the white truck. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know who made that decision, but maybe it was the great Andrew Nichol. <laughs> who knows? But yeah, the silver cars would have been nice. Yeah, they wouldn't let us near them. <laughs> we could barely even look at them. <laughs> Coming off the success of the Twilight series, was there a feeling or a sense of competition in making the host? Um, I, it's funny, I think uh, maybe a lot of other people f felt that, uh, but that was never a uh, cause for concern uh, for any one of us. We try to not avoid it at all costs, but it's just not, it's just, we're the, lucky it's not our job to worry about uh, past work. And, and that allows us to kind of make uh, this film at this moment. And, and it's out of Stephanie's mind. She's not thinking about Twilight. Uh, maybe the, the people with the money are. You know, they want to be that successful. But uh, it's nice not have to, to, to worry about that. They're very independent films, so I don't think you actually have to work that hard uh, to pull away from it. I think it is what it is. I think Stephanie's created a fantastic universe in the host. Um, yeah. 
and you know, Twilight was such a success that every new young adult fiction book film is being compared or anticipated to become the next Twilight. And that's just because we have never seen a phenomenon like Twilight before. Yeah. Um, with the uh, Stephanie Meyer sort of became the, the queen of the love triangle with its success of Twilight. In the host, she goes one step further and creates what a, a love square, a, a box. box yeah. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about that dynamic and you know how your character is related to loving the same person with you know, one body? Mm -hmm. Well, f for me personally, it was the thing that actually drew me to it um, because I, I think it's such an interesting, unique problem uh, for a character, for an actor to have uh, that you know you lose the woman you love, um, but then the physical form comes back as a daily reminder of what you've lost, but then to discover that in fact, um, to not only have to deal with that problem, but then to discover that the girl you once loved isn't in fact dead, but is in fact trapped inside. I mean, what a nightmare. Uh, it's an interesting problem to have. And two guys um, who deal with it, who have d different interests and deal with the problem completely differently. I think it's, it's a unique love square. And I think, I think Ian's big obstacle is that uh, she's not of our species. And that's one thing Andrew told me when he called me before I went and read for Ian was, uh, one reason I love Ian is because he's got this interspecies emotion that, that, that's developing and it's very strange and peculiar. And, uh, and so I think that's, yeah, that's interesting too. It, I lost that one. <laughs> and Chandler, you have any comments about that? Having to play with Trissa being in two different characters? Um, I don't know. I mean, Jamie, my character, you know, he sees uh, both of them as two separate people. A man of few words. This is great. He's a smart one. He's going to trail off like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> He's learning fast. Learning fast. <laughs> Chandler could probably, Ch Chandler's done more work, I think, uh, than both of us combined, so we should probably be taking advice from him. Um, <laughs> any advice? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, in terms of my dad, um, you know, it's a bit like parents giving you driving lessons. You know they're kind of right in the advice they're giving you, but it's a real pain in the ass nonetheless. Uh, so basically, yeah. But you no, know, he told me he t initially told me not to do it. But then once he saw I was serious, and that I think I went about it the right way, uh, he kind of backed off and let me do it. Uh, the movie opens by basically explaining that the world's kind of been saved uh, from us, which is kind of the interesting thing in, in its opening. So I'm wondering if there's an argument to be made here that the aliens are really the good guys, and that they're saving the world from us. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're a very strange anti-hero, in a way, because that's one of the questions it poses, is do we deserve this Earth and, and, and what we're doing to it and, and, and to each other? And, 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 it, and I think at the end, it, it allows you to sort of figure that out for yourself. Are you on... I think what's more, more interesting than Team Ian and Team Jared is Team Human or Team Alien, really, because that's the bigger question. Um, and uh, I think it's a kind of a spectacle we haven't seen before because we are so used to the ships coming in, blowing up the White House, and Will Smith saving the day. And I love that. Don't get me wrong. Like, I love that. Uh, but it's cool to see something like this that, uh, that hasn't been done, and I guess that's the, yeah, that's the I don't know if I remember this or, or from the book or from Stephanie talking or I don't know. Well, maybe I dreamt it. But I think um, that the, the souls uh, eventually, after one generation... When children are born, they give the child the choice whether or not to be inhabited, um, which is something that she might put more into into the second book, which is quite an interesting idea that they come here, they fix us up a bit, and then they kind of put us on the right path. Um, I don't know. Between, between both of you guys, I mean, you have Chris Jackson, I remember for Red Riding Hood, uh, and now the host, and you guys have been a part of this kind of new genre that we've seen come out. So what's it like to be a part of these like adaptations and they're highly anticipated and, and like, 
like living up to fan expectations? And do you guys block that out, or do you sleep over it? Or? No sleep loss over it because once you know once your performance is on celluloid or digital celluloid, it, your job's done. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, all the all that sort of effort went in uh, on the day of filming. Um, it's strange because these films they can allow you certain things because they are put on such a grand scale. Uh, if they're successful, they're successful on a grand scale. If they're failures, they're failures on a grand scale. So you know, with big risk can come big reward. Uh, but I think what interests me most in this sort of new world of YA films is that people like Chris Columbus, William Hurt, uh, Gary Oldman, these fantastic, talented people are doing these films. So they're slowly becoming more elevated, I think, each year because of the willingness. Uh, I know I think Kate Winslet's about to do one. I mean, it's, uh, it's strange to see them in it, but I mean, it makes, and that's why, that's why I've done the ones I've done personally, is because of filmmakers and the, uh, the, the actors involved.